So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Gasecki, and I am the Community Outreach and Education Coordinator for NAMI Greater Cleveland. Uh, today, we are hosting a webinar on the neurological and psychological symptoms and management of long COVID. We know this is a uh, important topic, um, one that's not altogether well understood in the mainstream. So we're very happy to have Dr. Bailey and Dr. Weingartner here to provide um, the most recent research and provide an education for us all on this topic. Topic. Um, a few words about the, our organization. NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Uh, we are considered a trusted community of voice on mental illness, representing the voices of mental health consumers and families and other members like professionals and organizations. We provide educational programs, support groups. We do outreach to our local communities, working with law enforcement, schools, universities, healthcare professionals, corporate groups, and we also operate a helpline uh, in addition to providing special education on uh, unique topics related to mental health, such as today's program. Just a few words before we get started. Uh, please remember to remain muted during the presentation. Um, if you have questions, please utilize the chat feature. I will be monitoring the chat. Um, we would like to focus primarily on covering the material on the slides first, and we should have around 15 to 10 minutes for questions before we end at one o'clock. This webinar is also being recorded and will be posted to the NAMI Greater Cleveland YouTube channel later this week, and I will make sure that you all receive these slides for the presentation afterwards as well. And the last thing that we will ask of you is that you complete a short anonymous evaluation for us on today's presentation. Um, so with that being said, I will hand it over to Dr. Bailey and Dr. Weingartner to get us started on this presentation. Thank you for um, educating our group on this topic and thank you all for being here with us today. Well, thank you for that, Matt. Um, so my name is uh, Dr. Chris Bailey. Uh, I am the Director of Neuropsychology for the Neurological Institute at University Hospitals. Um, and I'm here today with Dr. Jill Weingartner, who also is a neuropsychologist that uh, directs our, our neuropsychology rehabilitation program. We both have been very involved in um, kind of developing the protocols for our COVID recovery clinic. Um, particularly for people that are having some different um, memory, cognitive, and um, and behavioral complaints related to long COVID. So um, it's a it's a relevant topic that I know a lot of us have a lot of questions about, and we're still learning a lot about this topic, um, which is, I think, another thing that's an important thing to, to hear. Um, so we don't have any um, relevant disclosures um, to, to go through and, um, and mention. Um, and just to, to point out some of the different objectives that we have today. Um, so we're going to go through and describe patterns of cognitive mental health complaints um, in, in patients. Um, with, so when we're saying PASC, we're saying post-acute sequela of COVID-19. So that's another uh, way of, of saying kind of the medical term for long COVID. Um, and then also um, we'll then describe the, the rehabilitation approaches um, and key cognitive, uh, for key cognitive changes in patients who have long COVID. Um, and then also talk about how to, how to manage fatigue, which is a particularly prevalent symptom post COVID that people notice. Um, so I'm gonna start out by, by covering the, the cognitive complaints and outcomes side of things. And then Dr. Weingartner is gonna go through and talk about the rehabilitation strategies for both cognitive and uh, fatigue complaints. Um, I figured I would start out with a little bit of, about what is neuropsychology, because not, not everybody has a, a sense of what that, what that is in general. And so, um, so we're um, both basically uh, brain health and, and, and memory doctors. Um, so we are uh, clinical uh, PhDs um, that uh, then went on to do additional training in behavioral neurology. Um, essentially focusing on understanding brain behavior relationships. So um, if a person has a different neurological issue of a variety of kinds from um, whether or not we're talking about long COVID symptoms or maybe traumatic brain injury or um, you know, different sorts of dementias, um, and then how that then is related to behavioral changes, both in thinking and memory, as well as mental health outcomes as well. Um, and, and often what we do for this uh, is to do different kinds of cognitive tests. Um, so we can help to differentially diagnose patients, help to understand what are the different strengths and weaknesses that they have cognitively, um, identify different sorts of behavioral problems that may be related to neurological causes, 
and then establish treatment plans for those things. Um, and like I said, some of us may emphasize one of those things more than the other. I tend in my own practice uh, to emphasize more of the diagnostics and identification of cognitive problem um, in patients with different sorts of neurological histories. And, and Dr. Weingartner focuses more on the intervention side. So we're going to spend a little bit of time now talking about kind of the prevalence of neurological and mental health outcomes um, you know, post-COVID. Um, so what are the things that, that we're seeing um, in terms of uh, the prevalence of different kinds of conditions? And, and I'm going to cover several different studies as a part of my talk. Um, some of this may be a little data heavy, um, and I'm going to apologize for that up front. Um, but I'll try to explain some of the things if people are not that familiar with some of the science here. So um, what we're gonna, what I'm going to talk about here, this, this study is actually one that came out here just recently, came out last year. Um, it was actually done at CASE. And it used, it used a very large data, um, big data platform with from 68 different healthcare systems. Um, more than 6 million patients were involved um, in this study from uh, February of 2020 to May of 2021. And it's looking at different age groups and the likelihood of their developing Alzheimer's post-COVID. Um, and this um, over here on, on the right side, I don't know if, if you can see my cursor, but hopefully you can. Over here on the right side, this is the, what's called a hazard ratio. Um, but this is basically telling us how more likely it is that a patient who has a history of COVID of any kind, not just hospitalization, um, but people that have had COVID of any kind are to develop a neurodegenerative condition, Alzheimer's disease, um, post-COVID. And, and you can see that it's actually about 60 to 8 to 90 percent more likely to develop Alzheimer's post-COVID, especially in the older population. So if you're 85 or older, you're actually about 90, there's a 90 percent increased likelihood of developing uh, of Alzheimer's, which is uh, pretty, pretty significant. Um, so it's a it's a, a meaningful sort of, of problem. So again, especially in our older adults who had a history of COVID, they're there can be an increased risk for different sorts of neurodegenerative process. Um, and then also looking at different sorts of disease burdens. So again, one of the things that's really important when we're looking at, at COVID-19 um, COVID studies, and this is something that I think is, is especially important, um, is that there was a very strong push to get as much data out as possible because of how much um, how much of a, of a problem COVID was and how, how much of a burden it was having on, on patients. And so um, because of that, there's, there's a lot of variability in some of the different methodologies. And so it's really important to be thinking about the types of patients that are included in studies and um, you know, how they got the data and how it is that, that they analyze the data. Um, this is actually um, a, a data that, that came from the, from the VA, um, it was published in, in 2022. Um, there's 154,000 patients that were involved in, in, uh, in this study um, where they had two different control groups, one that had COVID and one that did not. And they just looked again at, at the rates of different sorts of neurological problems. Um, and again, looking at um, a hazard ratio. So again, the increased risk of developing a condition. And then the other component over here is just is the excess burden. So how many more people per thousand have the problem that we're talking about. Um, and this is about 12 months post COVID. So um, 12 months after the infection. And so what you see is again, there is an increased risk of these different sorts of problems. So different problems like stroke, migraine, seizures, headache disorders, other kinds of movement disorders like tremor or Parkinson's disease. So there's increase. So, the, so if it was the same as the, as the people that didn't have it, it would all be lining up on the one. Um, and so you see that there is increased risk for these kinds of problems. But actually, when you look over here at the number of patients per thousand that actually would develop those conditions, there's not there's not loads of people. There's really only one to five uh, people per thousand that would actually have these conditions that you wouldn't expect to have um, had they not had COVID. So again, it does it is associated with increased risk of some of these neurological these negative neurological outcomes, but not in a huge way. When we look at, at more specific memory and mental health conditions though, we can see again that there's increased risk for these problems um, and that there's actually a higher, there's a higher sort of excess burden as well. So especially memory concerns as well as major depressive and anxiety issues 
Um, we can see that more like 15, you know, five to 15 uh, people per thousand. So again, not huge numbers, but more than what we see with the, with the neurological um, only kinds of problems. Um, I'm going to move into now just talking about complaints. So, so we looked at the prevalence before and now patients own report of symptoms. And we're going to look at their report of these symptoms at different time points. Um, and so this is a little blurry, so sorry about that. But this is, again, looking at neurological complaints occurring within the first month post-COVID um, that people have. Um, and again, this is actually a, a systematic literature review of 57 different studies. Um, it had 250,000 survivors of COVID. This was actually pretty severe COVID. So, so 56%, um, actually, I'm sorry, 89, sorry, 79% of, of this group were hospitalized with COVID. So a more severe, more, more uh, significant sort of, not, not just people that had symptoms um, post. And, but again, what you see is that about a month post, um, there's, a, there's a good number of people, 20% of people that are reporting problems with their thinking and memory um, and concentration kinds of symptoms. Um, and if you look at mental health outcomes in that, again, there's a pretty significant number of people between 20 and 40% of people that are having symptoms of depression, sleep disturbance, and anxiety in that first month post-COVID. Um, so again, a pretty large proportion of people. Now, if we move that out into three months, and again, I'm sorry, some of this is a little blurry for you. Um, what you see is that there's there's a lower, there's a, a, a reduced sort of number of complaints that occur, um, you know, once you give some additional time to recover. More like 5 to 10% of men and women are endorsing different kinds of symptoms. And this is broken into different symptom clusters, um, whether or not it's fatigue or respiratory or cognitive com kinds of complaints. Um, so any of these symptom clusters, you get somewhere between 5 and 10%. Um, of, of people that are having different sorts of, of cognitive and memory complaints in, the, in the, the first three months. So again, pretty substantial early in the first month or so post. It reduces some over time. And in fact, if you extend this out into about 12 months, what you see is that really it's about the same number of people, somewhere between 5 and 10% of people endorse having some persisting symptoms of fatigue, cognitive, and other sorts of complaints. Now, what about actual findings on testing? So if we go through and do like a battery of tests as we're doing this, what does that tell us about people? And I think it's really important, again, to highlight that there are lots of problems when we're kind of looking at this literature at this point because of the push to get so many of these studies out as soon as possible. And so there's problems like having small sample sizes, there's different sorts of tests that were done. They were done at different time points on people, different degree of disease severity occurred, um, even different variants possibly had impact on some of this. So people that had the alpha versus delta versus Omicron sorts of variants. So again, there's, um, there's differences that make it hard to understand some of the things that are occurring. And in fact, I'm going to highlight just two studies and show you that there are pretty different outcomes that you can see with some of the different sorts of problems. Um, this is one that, that um, was, was done through the through, uh, uh, University of Iowa, um, and, it, and it actually has 53 consecutive patients that came into a post-COVID-19 clinic. Um, these were supposed to be, the, so the, the, the authors of this study made a, a, a point to try to um, really have what are the normal types of patients that are coming into our long COVID clinics to kind of really understand what those kinds of patients were. And, you know, again, these were people that had you know, all kinds of, of different degrees of COVID. Some of them were hospitalized. Some of them even required a ventilator, but not all of them were. In fact, most people did not require a hospitalization. Many of them had a high degree of other kinds of, of um of comorbid or, or other pre-morbid diagnoses. So 50% of the sample had four or more other medical or psychiatric diagnoses before they had the COVID, um, you know, the COVID illness onset. So they, these are people that uh, had a, a lot of different kinds of problems. Um, and this is a, a lot of information here, but I'm just going to point out that the, the, the things to, to see with this is that they gave them a very long battery of tests, several hours of testing cognitively, 
And of that, they still only 80% of them had, had, had either two or less impaired scores on the testing. So they actually didn't show many severe kinds of cognitive symptoms, they, they, but they were reporting those kinds of problems. They didn't show a lot of those problems. And in fact, when you actually go through and, and look at the, um, at the testing behind it, the thing that is most related to the cognitive problems that were shown actually was their endorsement of things like depression or anxiety. Now, that's just one study. If you go to a different study here, this is actually um, looking at nurses who had um, who had, had a, a COVID diagnosis. They went through, and, and, this, and this is 30 healthcare workers. Again, they were mostly nurses, um, mostly women. So 90% 90, 90 of the sample were women. Again, they had different degrees of, of, of COVID severity in terms of the, the illness that they had. Um, when they went through and did, again, a long battery of tests, they did show, so the red line here is what is considered normal performance. Um, in terms of the, the red line and above would be considered normal performance. They had some inefficiencies in, in their complex attention on some of the tests that they gave. Um, maybe a couple of inefficiencies in some of the memory symptoms that they had as well. And in this study, it actually was totally unrelated to depression and anxiety uh, for those individuals. So again, like I said, this literature is complex um, to, to understand, and we're still at a place where we're trying to understand it. Um, but you know, some of the conclusions that we can take away from this at this point is that patients who have a history of COVID, um, they're at increased risk for having some poor neurological and mental health outcomes. That reduces some after about a year. So over time, post-illness, post it, uh, it reduces the degree of problem that they have. But the most common concerns that people have are related to memory and mental health disorders. Um, symptom endorsement, um, again, is particularly significant in the first couple months um, and reduced to some degree by three months um, post. And like I said, the objective findings are, are mixed and kind of hard to understand um, at this point um, from a, from a, uh, when we're looking at some of the neurocognitive measures. Um, especially when you move beyond six months, we're seeing that there are some present kinds of cognitive symptoms that are related to complex attention and thinking speed aspects of, of memory and, and, our, and what we call executive function. But it has this complex interplay between your pre-existing conditions and high degrees of psychological distress. So if I'm really distressed and have other kinds of, of medical problems, that then is going to increase the risk of developing some of these kinds of symptoms too. And so often in our clinics, you know, it's, it's difficult to say, I, mean, I think a lot of times our patients are coming in and wanting to point to one thing. What is the thing that we need to treat or the thing that's going on that, that I can target and that's going to make my symptoms better? In many ways, there's many things to target, not just one that's producing a lot of those same kinds of symptoms. And I think I'm going to hand it over now. I'm going to stop, uh, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to, I'm going to give it over to, uh, to Dr. Weingartner to, uh, to talk about uh, the next one. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So um, we need those shut slides back up for me to share, actually, I think, because it's one slide deck, isn't it? I can do that if you want, you want me to, to run it. Yeah, I just need those same slides up, if possible, for me to share. Is that, is that possible? I can move it forward if you want me to do that. Yeah, that'd be great. Sure. Okay, so down to where you left off. Okay. Are you guys so are, the presenter mode or are you seeing the? Uh, I am just seeing, um, I think you need to advance them. So I, I, I think I. Uh, yeah, we're not seeing the, we're not seeing the current slide. We just have, I think you have to go into slideshow mode. Right. And I think Chris, you have to do that because I'm. Yeah, I know. I didn't I thought, know. Sorry about that. Yeah. All right, folks, we'll get there. We'll get there. 
All right, so there we are. Thank you. And I think I might have to get my trusted assistant here <laughs> to advance them for me. Hopefully, I, I, it, so if they can go into regular slideshow mode, not presenter mode. Are you, is this the other way? Okay, sorry. All right, so um, I'm really happy to be here talking with all of you about what do we do about it when we have symptoms of long COVID. So there are a number of um, symptoms that are common. I just pulled out one slide. You could pull out any number of studies and they would have probably a different variety of the common symptoms, but this, this captures lots of them. So these include the ones, the ones in red are the ones I'm gonna talk about a little bit more. So fatigue in particular, um, difficulty thinking or concentrating. So the brain fog that people talk about quite a lot, sleep problems, depression and anxiety. So some of the same things that Dr. Bailey has just mentioned. Um, next. So what is it like when you have brain fog? So what people talk about is that it feels like it's a persistent trouble with focusing, retaining short-term memories, and managing different complex tasks. So people complain of feeling mentally slow, feeling fuzzy, spaced out, feeling out of it, having no mental clarity, not being able to concentrate, and feeling confused. And so one person said to me, it's like swimming in molasses. Next. So what do people with long COVID say? So these are some of the things that people um, say are problems. Attention and concentration executive functions. Executive functions, let me just say a little bit about that. That refers to the overall abilities that allow us to sort of plan goals for ourselves, set plans to reach our goals, initiate the actions we need, and to complete our goals successfully. And that can feel much harder. Um, fatigue, emotional distress, identity change um, are also really important. So these are some of the things that people have said that I've, I've noted down in sessions. So I'm grieving myself, the death of myself. These have to do with such a sense of identity of who I am as a person, and now I can't think the same way. I don't feel right, I can't do things. I'm grieving myself. My bucket of effort, it's gone. People don't get it. They expect me to be like I was. I'd rather have cancer, people don't doubt it. So this reflects the experience of some people, uh, especially early days, when we didn't understand long COVID very well of going to the doctor and being dismissed or being told it's all in your head. Another person said, my job's creating a new normal, but sometimes I feel hopeless, like I've used up my fight. I've got no energy to do it. And another person talked about brain fog being the impact of fatigue on cognition. So he would have scored well on the test, but when he had the the, a lot of fatigue, he just couldn't execute his thinking processes very well. So next, what are the things that cause brain fog? We don't know yet um, the final answers, but there are lots of possibilities. So we think about microvascular changes, small, small um, changes in the vascular system in the brain. We think about metabolic changes or structural changes in the brain. If we lose oxygen for too long a period of time, that can cause problems in the brain. Inflammation, um, changes in our immune system, and also the medical treatment that happens in the hospital. So things like sedation, intubation, medications, those can cause changes and problems, as well as the psychological experience of going through long COVID or, and COVID. And those can include social isolation, feeling stressed and, and feeling anxious. Next. So what do we do about it? So this isn't very scientific. People say, well, well, let's just look at other diseases that look kind of the same and borrow some treatments from that. Or let's just tailor it to the person whether they need breathing exercises or some kind of therapy. Um, and so, in, in the separate one down here, the person says, well, we typically just ask the patient what their biggest complaint is. Is it headaches? Is it pain? Is it inability to smell things? Brain fog or fatigue? And we start there. 
And that's really kind of what we do is we, we look at similar um, diseases with similar symptoms and we start there. So next, so what helps with treating brain fog? You will get standard advice and it's all good advice, but it's given to everybody. So this advice includes, next, uh, get good sleep. Make sure you exercise. Eat well. Don't drink. Don't smoke. Keep yourself relaxed. Keep your mind busy with puzzles and things. And socialize. So those are all part of what makes for a healthy brain, and it's important to include all of these things. But with long COVID, there are specific things, too, that we need to pay attention to in a more detailed and personalized way. Next. So this is a way of looking at COVID, the experience of COVID, in a way that takes into account everything about who you are as a person. So the top row there includes a person's social network. Who's in their family? Who's in their social support system? Is it big? Is it small? And on the right, we talk about who you are as a person. What are your values? What are the things that you're interested in? What are the things that make you, you? And we also here look a little bit at how do you cope when things don't go well for you? Because that may be important to understand with COVID as well. So the middle layer there refers to the consequences physically, emotionally, and cognitively of long COVID, the potential ones. So as we said, some of the cognitive problems can include brain fog, can include memory problems, attention and concentration problems, and executive functions. And I'll talk more about these in a little bit. Uh, physically, we know lots of those physical problems are possible, fatigue, poor sleep, headaches, changes in smell and taste, shortness of breath, pain and aches, heart pounding, cough, fever, and there are lots more things that are possible physical problems. And you can see they hit lots of different areas of life. Then in the middle, we have the emotional changes. So those include depression and anxiety that Dr. Bailey referred to, but they can also include other experiences that aren't really a proper diagnostic category, but they're human reactions to situations such as finding yourself with a, a brand new disease that nobody knows a lot about. So you could be angry because your doctor doesn't understand you very well. Feeling misunderstood by family and friends who say, well, you look okay. Why can't you do things like you used to? What's going on here? These things can also lead to an altered sense of identity. So I've had people say, I've always been a person who exercised and I ran a marathon every year and I was really ambitious and hardworking. And now I can't do any of that. I can't even walk up my stairs. So it really changes our sense of who we are. And this also leads to a big loss of confidence. So how, how can we feel confident in our abilities when we've had these bizarre and peculiar experiences that change how we operate? So from, from this, we look at the consequences of COVID on your daily life. So are you able to continue with work or school? Can you take care of yourself, just your basic personal care or manage your household activities? What about your social and leisure activities? Have you stopped doing those because you don't have the energy anymore once you get through the day? Driving, what's the impact on that? And so this lets us appreciate the impact of COVID in a biopsychosocial way, so bio for the physical, psycho for emotional and cognitive and social as well, our surroundings and the people that we're, that we're involved with. So once we have, oops, sorry, one more thing, um, an appreciation of this, this leads us to our preliminary goals for rehabilitation. So in our, in our group, we work primarily on the emotional and cognitive aspects, and also fatigue and sleep problems. 
And we want to know the impact on work, independence. These are usually the goals that people have. I want to go back to work. I want to learn strategies to make this easier to manage. I don't want it to impact my relationship, things like that. Okay. Next. So I'm going to start out with attention because this is something that people frequently, frequently complain about. Um, you might say memory, but a lot of times it's because your attention wasn't able to be focused well enough or your concentration is poor, so you never got the information in in the first place. So um, I'm going to just start out, uh, this is the academic part, telling you a little bit about four types of attention. So the first type is selective attention. So selective attention involves focusing on one thing and ignoring other things. So that's where you all hear, you're trying to listen to me, but maybe the dog is barking or you're, you're thirsty or you're cold and you are thinking about other things here. So the next one is switching attention. So that means being able to move your attention from one thing to another thing. So that would be, for example, um, if someone really needed to talk to you and you needed to switch your attention from paying attention to this talk to someone there with something urgent you needed to attend to and being able to move over there. And the next one is being able to pay attention to more than one thing at the same time. So can we watch a TV program and uh, maybe play a word game at the same time? And then finally, sustaining our attention has to do with being able to keep our attention going over a long period of time. So can you listen to me over the course of the next several minutes, or do you find yourself kind of losing focus and then having to pull yourself back to it? So all of these aspects of attention can be impacted if you've had a bout of long COVID. So I like to look to the literature for advice on um, how we manage these things. So one of the things that we often think about is computer-based training, and the, the current research shows that that does not help. So you might find someone recommending a computerized kind of training game or training system. Uh, unless they're really, really well designed, what they do is they help you do this similar kind of thing a little bit better, but they don't help you in your day-to-day -day life. But there are some things that are recommended. So and next, the first one is something called metacognitive strategy training in relevant personal tasks. So what this refers to is, so I'll give you my favorite one and you can try this at home because most people have this problem. It's the, why did I come into this room phenomenon? You know, you know I'm cold, I'm gonna go get a sweater, uh, but on the way I see that the plant needs to be watered and I see that, you know, uh, the dog needs to go out, and then I totally lose track of why I came here. And that's like an experience that most of the folks I work with can relate to very easily, as well as a lot of my friends. So what can you do for that? A metacognitive strategy is something that you can apply in every example of the problem. So self-instruction involves forcing you to keep your goal at the front of your mind by saying it out loud. So I might say, I'm gonna go get a sweater because I'm cold, I'm getting my sweater, I'm going to get my sweater, I'm passing other things, I'm not gonna pay attention because I'm getting my sweater right now, I'm heading to my room to get my sweater. And you say it out loud until hands on the sweater. So I do advise telling family members that you're gonna do this because otherwise they might kind of wonder why you're suddenly doing this, um, but it does work because it focuses your attention on the task at hand. Next. So dual task training is a particular type of strategy that helps you pay attention to a couple of things at the same time. I'm not gonna to say too much more about that. Um, but what I really like about the NCON guidelines is that they address non-cognitive factors too. So attention can be affected by sleep problems. If we're not sleeping well, we're anxious, we're not sleeping well, and long COVID can affect sleep, then that's gonna mean it's harder to pay attention during the day. And that's not a cognitive issue, it's a, a sleep issue. So we need to be looking at sleep problems. Similarly, the next one 
has to do with the fact that emotions can also affect attention. So if we're anxious, it's very hard to focus. It's very hard to think about things in a flexible way. So there's particular evidence for cognitive behavioral therapy to help understand the interactions between emotions and attention. So, and finally, and this one I like too, it's got nothing to do with cognition or emotion, but it's looking at your environment. And so it's minimizing things in the environment that call your attention. So decluttering, you know, making sure that your environment is, is simple and doesn't have a lot of distracting elements in it. That would include something like, for example, many people keep the TV on in the background to keep them company, but that's gonna get in the way of attention. So again, and this is similar to what Dr. Bailey was saying, these problems can come up for a variety of reasons, some of which are cognitive, some of which may have to do with emotional issues, um, as well as physical issues such as poor sleep, or simply looking at the environment in a new way. Next. So this is a model of a patient who is looking at understanding her attention in a new and more um, more effective way. So this is the course of therapy. And, and so it, she starts out by saying, for me, attention is an intended action resulting in a meaningful output, such as focusing on reading, listening to someone talking, reading a map, or following a recipe. So relevant things to her daily life. And then she said, my attention is like a beam. It's like a flashlight. And I have control over it when I feel alert but it's diffuse when I feel tired. And then she says, my attention that deteriorates when I'm tired, I'm fatigued, when I get distracted, when I perseverate, which means kind of focusing on the same thing over and over again. And this can all lead to me feeling cheesed off. And then she says, my attention affects my memory. It affects my ability to problem solve. And it also affects my feelings. So I get really frustrated if things don't go to plan. So then, and this is over the course of some rehab, these are the things that this person has found to help her attention. If I do things when I'm not tired, I can focus better. If I pace myself, so I work for a certain amount of time and then I take a break, that helps. If I get rid of the distractions, turn the TV off, put the dog out, the next one is an emotional one. Be compassionate to myself. This isn't my fault. I didn't do anything to earn this. So I have to be kind to myself and, and treat myself well as I deal with these problems. And then here's an environmental one. I need to choose a quiet environment for completing complex tasks. So again, you can see how all of these things incorporate physical, emotional, and cognitive problems together and the approach to them is to look at all of those things. So on to fatigue. Fatigue is huge. Um, I just this morning met with a patient who has long COVID and she said, does everybody have fatigue? And I thought for a minute and I think, I think everybody I've seen with long COVID has fatigue and it comes from a lot of other sources too. So I think it's an important topic. So this is a handbook um, from the Headway Organization in the United Kingdom on managing fatigue for people who have it. It's not a technical book, it's for you if you have it. So if you're interested in learning more about that, remind me later on, I'll get you the information. Next. So there are different types of fatigue. And it's important to understand that the kind of physical fatigue that we experience if we exercise is really different from mental and emotional fatigue. So our normal fatigue comes if we go have a good workout, our muscles are a little bit sore, we might feel a little bit clumsy, but it's a, it's a normal and positive experience. Mental and emotional fatigue that come with an injury or illness affecting the brain are very different. So with mental fatigue, the person feels that it's hard to concentrate, it's hard to remember things, it's hard to think things through and come up with 
solutions to problems. It's really hard to initiate and keep going with things. It's confusing, people don't understand. And similarly, with emotional fatigue, people experience feelings, thoughts, and behaviors maybe in different ways or in new ways than they had before. We also know that if you worry all the time, so if anxiety becomes part of the experience, that drains your energy. And so does emotional distress. They can really be taxing and take a lot out of you and that creates emotional fatigue. Okay, so we also, the next one please. We can also look at fatigue in, in this kind of visual way. Um, and this is another example, just to show you how um, rehab can work of a patient with serious fatigue. And so for him, he put this together and saying, okay, what are the things that make me personally vulnerable to fatigue? And it was the direct brain injury that he had. Plus he was on a lot of pain. He had a lot of pain for which he was on a lot of medication. He didn't sleep well, he was deconditioned, and he had some cognitive impairments as well that got in the way. So that was helpful, we laid out all of those factors. And then we looked at what are your particular triggers for your fatigue? So people with fatigue may have widely different triggers, they're very personal and it can be kind of informative to hear that fatigue can come from things like not feeling in control, as well as feeling stressed or pressured, being in an unfamiliar situation, being around people, being in a noisy environment, not the usual things that we think about that would trigger fatigue, but they do for some people. So it's really important to look at what your own personal fatigue triggers might be. So for this person, fatigue led to and that's, this is the middle kind of starry thing, um, being sleepy, having trouble focusing, having headaches, feeling fidgety, and feeling overwhelmed. Again, physical things, cognitive things, and emotional things, all being part of the fatigue experience there. So in the past, this person had wrote down some things that he did that were not helpful. So the first one is having an impulse to push on and not take a break. And that I can say is one of the worst responses, but the most natural too. You think, oh, I'm feeling good for a little minute. I'm gonna keep on going and then boom, you crash. You can't do that. You've gotta stop before you get to the point where you feel tired. Taking too many naps was a problem for him. Making impulsive decisions. Who'd have thought that's what he did when he was fatigued and it wasn't a good thing. Having a big breakfast or drinking wine and eating chocolate for him, sleeping in for too long and having fights with his partner. So then at the bottom, we have the, the mediating factors. So these are the things that help him learn to understand and manage his fatigue. So they included understanding what his triggers for fatigue were being aware of his own fatigue levels and learning to rate them, looking at the time of day because his fatigue changed over the course of the day, and finding out that when a day is very structured, his fatigue was much less. So this led to the list of helpful responses over there on the right, him saying, I can't just push on, I need downtime. So we had some strategies to prevent the fatigue in the first place. And those included planning ahead so that there wasn't a big burden when the time came, developing routines, delegating tasks to other people, pacing himself, getting better sleep and managing his pain better. Even things for him like having good lighting and the right temperature made him more comfortable and then he wouldn't have to um, experience as much fatigue and getting more exercise. If he already had the fatigue, then things like mindfulness practice and short power naps were, were things that helped him. Next. So how about factors interact with each other? It's different for anybody. So here's, here's a series of things that you might say to yourself. I think it would be common, but not for everybody. So the first one is, 
I'm trying to read directions. And then I can't keep my focus. I mess up. I must be so stupid. I'm a failure. I'm mad and I'm sad. I'm not trying this again. I'm exhausted. So again, you can see how an initial problem can lead to emotional distress, fatigue, and then just giving up. And then this creates a pattern that's hard to break. Okay. Next one. So some things that we can do about fatigue. First of all, the medical factors. We obviously need to make sure that there aren't any underlying medical causes for the fatigue. So we look at medication for mood disorders, and, and also medication to manage um, excessive daytime sleepiness if it's present. We also really need to manage and look at sleep because that obviously can lead to fatigue. So we do that through evaluating and treating sleep disorders, such as sleep apnea or other kinds of things, using good sleep hygiene, and we work on that in rehabilitation quite a bit, um, and also reducing ruminating. And ruminating is having something in your mind, churning, churning, churning around, you just can't get rid of it. And so there are some techniques for helping reduce the rumination, that reduces anxiety, and that improves sleep. And then exercise and nutrition, as we've already talked about. So the next one is thinking about energy conservation. So this is a classic fatigue management slide here with the four P. So the first one is pacing. And that means that you've got to take regular rest breaks. You can't just plow on through and think it's going to work. We also need to learn to recognize when our energy battery is empty and stop before we get there. We need to alternate energizing activities, which might be taking a walk or playing a computer game, in between tiring activities, which might include things like reading a book chapter um, or doing a work task. So it also includes giving yourself more time to complete your activity. So, so the next P is prioritizing. So this would involve doing things like pick the most important thing to do first when you have the most energy. Do that first. Think about whether you could give this task to somebody else or just not even do it. Oops, thanks. Um, this also includes enjoyable activities. So I think a lot of people tend to let go of their enjoyable activities because they're putting all their effort into the things that must be done. But we, we really need to keep those in there too to keep life balanced. So the next one is planning. So planning ahead and trying to stay organized, which is harder to do for many people with long COVID, but um, we've got some rehab techniques to help with kind of helping to be more actively organizing of your time and thinking about what times of day are you at your best and using those times for the most difficult tasks. And the last one is positioning. And that is, is something that we need to think about too. So an example of that is I worked with someone who was a mom, so she did a lot of laundry and it exhausted her to fold the clothes when the laundry was done, just exhausting. She hated it. And so, she would stand at the, in the laundry room and fold laundry over the, the washer and then go put it away. So we changed it, put the laundry in a basket, took it to the living room, put it on the coffee table, turned on her favorite soap opera. She sat on the couch and folded clothes until her soap opera was done. And it was much more engaging and restful and no longer a fatiguing and dreaded activity. So simple things like positioning are helpful too. So next, we want to also think about our mood strategies. So um, I think many of you are familiar with the various psychotherapies that are available now, cognitive behavioral therapy and a variety of others. Um, the diagram below is a toolkit that I like to give people. Um, it's their own toolkit. And so it's got their medicines in there and the things that really work for them. So keeping a gratitude journal, doing some mindfulness, um, listening to music, calming breathing, and space, that kind of thing. Next, 
I realize I'm gonna talk a little faster here. Um, cognitive strategies too. So really a, an advocate for using um, notebooks, calendars, phone reminders and alarms, things like that to help you stay organized and, remi and reminding to do things. Um, as well as what we talked about before um, for attention. So the self-talk strategy, using your attention like it's a beam that you can direct around. There are lots of strategies to help us kind of think through that. So next. Um, and managing the environment, as we mentioned before, keep things in the same place, keep spaces organized and uncluttered, um, reduce background noise, take uninterrupted personal breaks, and letting other people know that you're doing that too. And the next, and recharging our battery. So power naps, don't make them longer than 20, 30 minutes at the most before four o'clock. Um, use relaxation techniques. There's lots of apps out there that are really good for relaxation and mindfulness. Um, listening to music, music, some general exercise, um, being social or alone, whatever really works best for you is the right thing to do. Next. Um, just go on further. Skip this. I don't have time for it. I'd skip this one too, if you would. Sorry. Um, this is that was another toolkit with lots of tools in it. So I guess the last thing I want to say is that we do have a COVID recovery clinic at UH, and here's the number and the information about it in case you feel like this would be a resource that would be a top to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Weingartner and Dr. Bailey. I think I learned a lot of new information um, from this presentation. Um, just for everyone's awareness, um, this webinar is being recorded. We'll post it uh, later this week on our YouTube channel. And I will also ensure that you all receive the slides from this presentation later today as well. Um, I would like to open it up now for questions. Um, if you do have a question, please put it in the chat. I see we do have one question already. This is from Steph who asks, um, exercise is mentioned as a way to help brain fog, but many long COVID patients have exercise intolerance and post-exertional malaise. So is that is this contraindicated in many cases? Yeah, and, and that's right. I think post-exertional malaise, where you really can't take a step without being exhausted, is a very much of a medical condition that needs to be managed um, properly through physical therapy. But what other people experience of fatigue is it isn't quite that um, drastic. It's, it's a terrible experience. What other people experience is that just things take effort. And so for them, um, some gentle graded exercise that's done in a programmed kind of way can, can be helpful. Yeah. Chris, you wanna add anything to that? Sure, I would just say that exercise often is is a brain healthy activity in general for a variety of conditions, not just not just post COVID. So, um, a minimum of sixty minutes of exercise a week is with among the things that can be helpful in a lot of ways. Even different sorts of degenerative conditions, it's sh shown to help to resist decline. So, um, usually, what's good for brain health is good for is is also good for heart health, and so those are things that are that are common. So it, it's usually helpful in most cases, I think, though it, it's not a panacea. Thank you. I did also put the link to that. Um, toolkit, the booklet about managing fatigue after a brain injury. I found that on the Headway um, website. So I put the link for that booklet in the chat after you were talking about it. I did also put in the chat the link for the survey for today's program. Um, please complete that survey before we end. If you can just click that link for me and um, it should take uh, only a few minutes. It's short, anonymous. We really appreciate your honest feedback and your ideas for future programs. Um, any final questions before we end? We do have a few minutes. Just give it another minute to see if anyone would like to put a question in the chat. I'm not seeing any. So if we have no further questions, um, just want to um, 
oh, here's a question. Um, were the statistics that were shown in the um, early part of the presentation, Dr. Bailey, were those shown post vaccination or uh, before we had the COVID vaccine? So I think most of the studies were post vaccination, though um, not all of them. And again, it's, a, it's among the many methodological questions, right, that, that, that occur. So like I said, different variants, pre-post vaccine. Um, so you know, some people report the you know, vaccination specific kinds of responses too. Again, there's, there's a, a host of issues that are things that make that literature, again, I think the way to think about it is it's, it's a new literature that we're trying to understand more about. Um, and we're just at a place where there's, there's, a, there's not a lot we can really glean from it other than we know that people are at risk for different sorts of negative outcomes, both neurologically and from a mental health standpoint, um, and that there's a complex interplay between all of those problems. Um, other question in here, um, this is referring to the, one of the quotes that was featured from one of the patients in the slides. Um, how can we get doctors to, this is a big question though, how can we get doctors to believe patients so they aren't saying things like they would rather have cancer? <laughs> That's where we need to work with our colleagues, I think. I, I think the more evidence that comes out that demonstrates long COVID to have biological bases, the more patients complain, the better. But I think it is a really huge issue. And an, another place where I think people are having a lot of challenge is if they need to go on disability, whether it's government or work-related um, disability, and, and having, having that um, be acknowledged. That, that long COVID can indeed cause enough problems for people not to be able to work. But I keep looking for the good doctors because there's lots out there, even though I know that some people have had some tough experiences. Yeah, and I, I think that the, um, in hearing the people that are working our COVID recovery clinic, that's among the most important factors that they talk about is, is uh, you know, taking the time to listen to patients. Um, and I think that sometimes that's a response that doctors have when they don't really know what to do. Um, so if you know if we don't have really obvious treatments for problems and we're not sure what to do, sometimes the, they dismiss things. And unfortunately, this is a new condition where it's not been very clear what to do in different circumstances. So again, I think that the, the more specialized clinics are ones that are more likely to take things pretty seriously. And so the, the COVID recovery clinic that was included in the last slide, is that a resource for individuals living in Northeast Ohio? Okay. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think we will cut it there. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you generously donating your time and expertise to educating our audience on this topic. And um, hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Well, thanks for having us.